Living in Russia in 2024 is no joke. The state's grip on the population has never been tighter. Surveillance is everywhere. The streets are lined with facial recognition cameras that can identify you and track you in real time. There are over 170,000 of them in Moscow alone. Every step, every glance, every suspicious gesture or meeting has the potential to land you in jail. Oh, yeah, and there's a war going on. Since it started, tens of thousands of people have been locked up, either for protesting against or trying to avoid conscription or saying the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. In the first three weeks of the conflict, between February and March 2022, about 15,000 people were locked up for opposing it. So it makes sense that thousands and thousands of Russians are fleeing across the nation's borders. Here's how some of the more high-profile people have managed to escape Russia. If you want to be creative, you can fake your own death Tom Sawyer style. This is what Russian journalist Arkady Babchenko did in 2018 with the help of Ukraine's security services. Now, to be fair, Babchenko had already kind of escaped Russia, Russian borders at least. In 2017, he fled to Prague and then to Kiev. But Putin's regime had their eyes on him, and they were a menacing, beady, I'm gonna kill you type of eyes. Babchenko was a vocal critic of the Kremlin. He'd served in the Russian military, and he fought in the First and Second Chechen Wars in the 90s and early 2000s, then became a war correspondent, then called for more fair elections and supported a movement that was advocating for them, which Putin didn't like, which made him a target for one of Putin's patented disappearing dissenter magic tricks. Intelligence revealed that a contract had been taken out on his life after he fled to Kiev. Instead of waiting for the inevitable, Babchenko and the Ukrainian Security Service, or the SBU, cooked up a plan to fake his own assassination. And it was a good setup. The SBU arranged for a fake assailant to shoot Babchenko in his apartment. They used pig's blood to make the scene as realistic as possible. Babchenko's wife found him dead on the floor. Horrified, she went to the authorities to report the demise of her husband. But she was in on it too. The body was rushed to a morgue where Babchenko cleaned up, got some popcorn, then sat down to watch the news reports of his own death. The news of Babchenko's assassination spread like wildfire. Headlines mourned the loss of yet another journalist to the Kremlin's long arm. Condolences poured in and international media were quick to condemn the act. Meanwhile, Babchenko laid low, monitoring the situation as the SBU worked on identifying and neutralizing the threat to his life. They were able to, and it turned out that Babchenko was just one of 30 people in Ukraine who were on a Russian hit list and scheduled for an early retirement. Once the danger had been eliminated, Babchenko emerged at a press conference very much alive. The world was stunned. We are happy that Arkady is alive and that his attempted murder was prevented, a media watchdog group told The Guardian. But, they added, everybody now feels manipulated. I guess Russia felt manipulated too. There's still a bounty out on his head. But Babchenko seems like a pretty resilient guy. He once said that he wants to return to Russia someday, driving an American-made Abrams tank. How's this for a movie trailer? An operation gone awry pushed him deep into enemy territory. His wife prepared for his funeral. Then he came back. Cue the dramatic music and montage of fighting scenes. This isn't from a film, though. It's a real headline about a real Ukrainian soldier who crawled for three real days to get back from behind Russian lines. Now, we don't know his name. He goes only by his nickname, Kokol, which is both a derogatory term that Russians use for Ukrainians and a word that means son of heaven in Crimean Tatar. Kokol has been interviewed by multiple news outlets where he recounted his return from the brink of death, which happened in October 2023. You can say Kokol has a thing for adventure. Before joining Ukraine's Art and Special Forces unit, he was, well, a pirate hunter. Or a pirate security guard, I guess. He'd provide armed protection for tankers moving through the waters along the eastern coast of Africa. Pirate country. But in 2019, he joined the Ukrainian military. When the war started, he ended up on the front, and by 2023 was fighting outside of Kharkiv on the Russian border, where this story starts. The mission begins with his platoon of 28 men, well equipped with weapons and night vision devices. They're there to replace forces in six positions, but the situation quickly gets out of hand. Tanks attack their flanks and there are casualties. By day's end, two are dead, eight are wounded, and 11 have concussions. Now with all that chaos going on, an enemy group infiltrates their positions and hits them from multiple angles. In the face of all this, Kokel decides to lead a night assault and his unit takes six prisoners captive. But things take a turn for the worse when all their night vision devices and thermal imagers stop working, and their drones are recharging, giving them no air support. 
they're basically walking blind, and they end up right in the middle of enemy territory. Russian soldiers meet them with grenades and gunfire. Left with only two and a half magazines of ammunition, Kokel orders his guys to retreat. He tries to create a diversion by shooting to the right while his fellow soldiers remain silent and go left. The plan? Well, it fails. Reinforcements arrive for the Russians, and Kokel is separated from his unit and forced to move deeper into enemy territory. He later realizes he's entered a minefield. In the morning, he wakes up amidst explosions. Drones are dropping bombs in areas the Russians think he might be in, and they fire towards him with a grenade launcher. The grass is tall, and he's able to stay hidden, but he has to crawl. For three days and two nights, Kokel crawls. He crawls about three and a half kilometers, at one point dodging sniper bullets, possibly bullets from his own forces. With no food or water, he loses 12 kilograms and starts hallucinating by the second day from exhaustion and dehydration. When he finally reaches the outskirts of Ivanivka, he discovers a cemetery where some water has been left in a half-empty bottle. He rations it, drop by drop. Eventually, he stands up, barely amidst the ongoing battle sounds of machine guns and mortars. Finally, he spots Ukrainian troops. Dropping his weapon, he raises his hands and approaches them, pleading, Guys, I'm unarmed. I'm, I'm one of you. In some cases, if you want to escape Russia, you'll have to escape one of its prisons first. Facilities like Black Dolphin Prison, Vladimir Central Prison, IK-6 Penal Colony, Butyrka Prison, Lefortorvo Prison, and Matroska Tishina Prison have housed some of the country's most dangerous criminals, and some of those unlucky enough to be caught protesting things like, you know, fair elections and human rights issues. Alexander Solonik was one of the former. He was a police officer turned hitman nicknamed Sasha the Macedonian and Super Killer. He was also really good at wiggling out of these prisons. Solonik kicked off his career as a police patrolman in the early 80s, but he was expelled from the force after, quote, discrediting the rank of police officer. He took a job as a grave digger in Kurgan, his hometown, and then eventually moved on to putting people in those graves. He would soon join up with the Kurgan criminal organization and became one of their best hitmen. I'm sure his family was so proud. But first, in 1987, he was convicted of assaulting a woman and sentenced to eight years. But he managed to jump out of a second floor window to avoid capture and went on the lam for a few months before he was finally caught and thrown in prison. That eight year stint only lasted two years because he managed to escape. He then returned to Kurgan, joined its mafia, and quickly made a name for himself as a hitman, taking out several high-profile rival mobsters. But the law caught up with him. He was eventually nabbed by Moscow police, who apparently are not very good at their jobs because they failed to find a Glock he was hiding on him. When he got to the police station, he pulled it out and started firing at the officers before being shot himself and then taken to Matroska Tishina prison. Only three people have ever escaped Matroska Tishina prison, and Solonik is one of them. In 1995, with the help of a corrupt jailer who probably had mob ties, Solonik got his hands on a pistol and some climbing equipment and slid down using a rope from the prison roof, leaving a mannequin under his blanket to delay the guard's discovery of his absence. Why is there a mannequin in prison? Solonik then got a passport from the Greek consulate in Moscow, thanks to some more mob connections, and then fled to Greece. In Greece, he set up his own criminal organization involved in drug smuggling and contract killings. He even got plastic surgery to conceal his identity and amassed an empire, buying villa after villa and dating supermodels. But his freedom eh, didn't last too long. On January 31, 1997, Alexander Pustavilov, a fellow hitman, strangled Solonik to death in his villa with an extension cord. Ooh, ouch. If you're not as resourceful as Solonik and can't escape prison, you might have to escape Russia through a prisoner exchange. Prisoner exchanges have become common in the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine, but they're nothing new. There have been multiple between the U.S. and Russia alone over the years. One of the craziest was the illegal programs exchange in 2010, which involved 10 Russian sleeper agents who were arrested in the U.S. These agents had been deeply embedded in American society, posing as ordinary citizens while building contacts to gather intelligence. Heck, one of them got a job at Microsoft. After their arrest in a multi-year FBI investigation dubbed Operation Ghost Stories, they were exchanged for four Russians convicted of spying for the West. But let's talk about one recently that made headlines, the exchange between WNBA star Brittany Griner and a Russian known as the Merchant of Death. Victor Bout was a former Soviet military officer who made it big, capitalizing on the collapse of the Soviet Union by getting his hands on, like, almost all their guns. He built a worldwide empire of death, supplying arms to warlords, rogue states, and insurgent groups across Africa, Asia, and South America. 
Bout's clients ranged from the Taliban to different factions in African civil wars, and he quickly became one of the world's most prolific arms dealers. Bout's downfall came via a U.S. DEA sting operation, where undercover agents posed as Colombian rebels and negotiated with him for the supply of surface-to-air missiles and a bunch of other weapons. He was eventually arrested in Thailand in 2008 and extradited to the U.S. despite intense Russian protests. In 2012, he was convicted on multiple terrorism-related charges and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Fast forward to 2022, and Brittany Griner, an American WNBA star and two-time Olympic gold medalist, found herself entangled in international politics. She was detained in Russia for carrying cannabis oil and sentenced to nine years in a penal colony. Russia had just recently invaded Ukraine, and many speculate that she was being used as a political pawn. But she got out, eventually. The U.S. and Russia agreed to swap bout for Griner, and on December 8, 2022, at an airport in Abu Dhabi, they did just that. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, the bell, subscribe, and all that good stuff to stay up to date on the nuttiest stories humanity has to offer.